Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Right. Uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for attending our lecture in person and online. Tonight we have the pleasure of uh, talking to Professor Katerina Harvazi, uh, who will introduce us to the broader context uh, of research in Apidema Caves and present us uh, the recent updates from the ongoing archaeological and geological uh, project there. The project, conducted under the, uh, conducted under the auspices of the Norwegian Institute at Athens, is currently entering its second field season with much anticipated results from a cave uh, complex considered among the most important for uh, Paleolithic research in Europe. The project is directed by Professor Katerina Harvati and Dr. Evangelos Kudlukis, uh, who is a senior researcher for paleoanthropology at the University of Virginia and assistant professor in prehistoric uh, uh, archaeology at the University of Tijuana. Unfortunately, Dr. Kudlukis, due to job related commitments, was not able to be with us tonight. Though, please consider tonight's lecture as a joint, I for the joint venture, venture of the two project directors. Before handing over the microphone, allow me to present our speaker, and I will try to be as brief as possible, although, do uh, you know the work of Katerina, this is an almost impossible task. Uh, so, Professor Cavalli is Professor uh, for Paleoanthropology at the Institute of Archaeological Science and Director of the Second Best Center for Human Evolution and Paleoenvironment at the University of Tübingen. She is also a professor at the Center for Early Sapiens Behavior at the University of Bargain. Of course, there are many more affiliations, and I would uh, advise you uh, to consult or print out uh, for the rest of them. The research focuses on issues in human evolution with special emphasis on Neanderthal paleobiology, on modern human origins and dispersals, and on paleoanthropology of Southeast Europe. The broader interests include primate evolution and life history, the settlement of the Americas, and the understanding of the evolutionary processes underlying human skeletal variation. Among her many distinctions in 2021, she was awarded with the highest academic distinction in Germany, the Fourth Fifth Wilhelm Leibniz Prize, and in 2022, she was elected member of the German National Academy of Sciences. Professor Harvat is the recipient of three ERC grants, in the framework of this project, she has been conducting extensive research uh, programs in Greece. Currently, she directs the investigations of the five-year research project at the Apidema Cave Complex together with Dr. Toulouse. She has also co-directed many uh, fieldwork elsewhere in Europe and in Africa since 2006. Uh, if I try to give an account of Professor Kavatis's publications, so we we'll probably have to postpone this lecture because we will run out of time. Uh, so I would suggest you uh, discuss it with her after the lecture and during the reception. So without any further delay, let us all give a warm, uh, warm welcome to Professor Carvalho. for the very nice introduction and I just want to point out that my co-author on this talk and co-director Vangelis Tobiukis is actually online so he's following and <coughs> he's available to answer questions online uh, later on uh, if there are uh, specific questions for him. So okay, uh, perhaps we can start? Danaro. Danaro, okay. No? Oh yes, okay. So this is a brief overview of uh, what I'm going to speak about today. Uh, I would like to first give you uh, an overview of the role of Southeast Europe in human evolution in general. Um, we will then shift and talk more specifically about monohuman origins and the background to monohuman origins. And then we will get to the Apigaman Caves where I will present to you the previous research that has, um, has happened there at the site, uh, also earlier in the 70s and 80s, but more recently also by our team. And then finally, I will finally get to the new research program that uh, just uh, started last year um, under the auspices of the Norwegian Institute, which is a field uh, investigation of the Tigma Cave Complex. Okay, so let's start with the open questions in Eurasia paleoanthropology. There are many uh, still. Europe is actually the continent that is the most well known in terms of paleolithic archaeology and paleoanthropology, and yet. Many open questions remain. Among them is the question of when was Europe first colonized by early humans? What was the identity of species for these hominins and where did they come from? How many species of hominin were present in places in Europe? Uh, did we have survivals of archaic lineages in refugia, such as the southern peninsula of Europe, for example? 
and what were the possible cultural and or biological interactions and exchanges among these lineages, including, of course, more humans as well as Neanderthals. And for all of these questions, for me, it's, it's very obvious that Southeast <coughs> Europe is actually of paramount importance in answering these, um, these points. And why is this? Because of the dual role of this area. At the same time, um, Southeast Europe is on the most direct route of dispersal from Africa, from the Near East, from Asia into Europe and vice versa. But it also it represents one of the refugia areas, the southern peninsula of Europe, where you would expect to have survival of plant and animal species during glacial times, when they would disappear from more northern areas in, in the continent. And when the conditions improved, you would expect that these plant and animal communities actually recolonize the rest of the continent. And the same is true for human populations. So not only is this a kind of a highway for dispersals into and out of Europe, but it also is an area where you would expect populations to actually survive the longest. So what you would expect on the basis of this biogeographic position is that you would have among the earliest evidence for human presence in Europe, in this region, because it's the first step, let's put it this way. But also, you would expect to have one of the longest records of human presence, one of the most continuous records of human presence in this area. Why? Because they would actually, presumably, survive in this uh, refugium area. And finally, you would also expect a very high variability. So potentially, multiple lineages, multiple species being present at the same time. So late survivals, archaic lineages, new arrivals coming from different directions, and possibly cultural and biological exchange taking place. So a kind of melting pot, so to speak. Pleistocene melting pot. When we look, however, at the actual picture of um, the Paleolithic map of Europe, and this is uh, outdated, so this map actually comes from, I think it's 2006 or something like this. So there has a lot, there has been a lot of new evidence that has been added. But when we look, so for example, when I was in university looking at the Paleolithic map of Europe, what we saw was this. A lot of uh, sites, of course, uh, Paleolithic sites in Central and Western Europe, a lot of them also in the Caucasus region and the Near East, and in the middle, in this very central region that we were just talking about, it's basically a gap. And this map is talking about Neanderthal sites and early Neanderthal sites, but it's basically the same picture if you look at earlier time periods, so the lower Paleolithic, as well as if you look at later time periods, so the upper Paleolithic, for example. So we have been actually, my team and I and our collaborators in Greece have been conducting since I guess now more than 10 years, quite intensive research trying to answer these questions and fill in this research gap, which is very critical research gap in answering questions about human evolution in Europe, starting with uh, 2011, years in starting ground, an anthropology at the gates of Europe, which identified the oldest currently known and actually uh, dated archaeological site in Greece, Marathusa 1. Uh, more recently, the consolidator grant crossroads, uh, where we uh, one of the results was the identification of the earliest dispersal of Homo sapiens into Eurasia, which I'm going to talk about um, later today. And finally, even more recently, currently going on, an advanced grant of first steps to Europe, uh, which is focusing not only on Greece but also on Europe as well as the Central Balkans and at the same time an ERC consolidator grant from uh, my uh, close colleague and assistant, um, Dr. El Zatari, who is working in the Paleolithic of Lebanon. So, um, I don't want to dwell on this, this is what I want to present the team, and here starting with uh, a paleoanthropology at the gates of Europe, um, you see already some of the people that are in the room today, even with uh, Magnus Lucas, who's of course the co-director and co-author uh, co of this talk, George Gondais, um, Domenico Giusti, who are still in the team, and, oops, sorry, let's get past. 
And of course, a lot of the same uh, faces continuing on with Crossroads, uh, including, of course, Nick Thompson, who is here, Fabian the Judith Byer, Carol Robin, um, all uh, even still current members of the team. And to give you an idea what were the goals of these projects, basically to conduct systematic and targeted uh, survey to identify uh, finds and sites, hopefully in situ, where you could have we could have the geological background, uh, we could take it into account, and we could have context for dating, for example. Uh, but also the reinterpretation of existing hominin fossils from the region, and this is what I'm going to talk about next. The development of a chronological and environmental framework. And of course, all of this work was conducted always in collaboration with several partners in Greece, including from the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports, the uh, FOA of Theatropology and Spirology, the University of Athens, the University of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and of course now, much more recently, also the Norwegian Institute. Okay, so now let's shift gears a little bit and let me give you some background on modern human origins. So the earliest modern humans are known to have appeared in Africa right around 300,000 years before present. And we have them appearing in Northern Africa, but also in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. And we have uh, multiple populations that are considered, geographic populations that are considered to be ancestral to give rise to modern human living today. At the same time, in, in Europe, during this time period, we have the Neanderthal lineage. So Europe has been considered, actually until very recently, the exclusive territory of Neanderthals from approximately, or older than 300,000, until approximately 39,000 years ago when they disappeared from the record. And at this time, we also have other taxa still around. For example, late Homo erectus in Indonesia, uh, the mysterious Denisovans in, in Asia, and so on and so forth. That's what the global picture looks like. So multiple species, the ancestors of, of modern humans, or early modern humans in Africa, Neanderthals in Europe and so Western Eurasia, Denisovans in Asia, and a late surviving Homo erectus in Southeast Asia. So these are uh, at least four species present at this time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Neanderthals. So they are considered a European species, but their geographical range actually extended all the way to Siberia. And uh, we know them from multiple sites all across uh, Europe, the Near East, and even uh, the Western part of and Central Asia. They are distinguished from modern humans on the basis of several morphological features, as well as distinctive DNA. So if you were to compare a Neanderthal, see here, Gibraltar 1, the Neanderthal female, from uh, of the Iberian Peninsula, compared here with our big Pato 1, also a female, a early apocalyptic female from France, modern human, you see several differences. And one of them is, for example, perhaps the first thing that strikes you, the thick, doubly arched superorbital torus, which doesn't exist in modern humans. We don't have such a structure. The very low and receding forehead, as opposed to a very highly domed forehead and high cranium, a very large nasal opening and large sort of circular um, orbits as opposed to more narrow uh, nasal opening and nasal cavity, an inflated kind of puppy, cheekbone and receding zygomatic as opposed to a concave cheekbone and uh, angled zygomatic bone here. I can show you some additional differences if you look at these um, a Neanderthal and a modern human from a lateral view, you would see a very different shape of the cranium, a low and elongated uh, neurocranium, right, brain case, which is drawn, even drawn further out towards the back, bulging towards the back. This is called an occipital bun. It's a typical Neanderthal feature, as opposed to a very high and rounded uh, cranium in the modern human, completely different shape. You would notice again the very thick projection of the superorbital torus of the belly region, 
as opposed to no projection and there's no projection at all. A protruding nasal region and face that looks as if it's been pulled forward by the nose, as opposed to a face that is very flat and tough under the dangers in a modern human, and a whole other, a whole list of features that I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to list in detail now in the base of the cranium that are actually uh, quite different. And the list goes on. I do want to show you the back of the skull and the Neanderthal has this rounded outline called embon, as opposed to this um, entente, uh, so pentagonal shape in modern humans. The broadest part of the skull, widest part of the cranium is at the mid midway, halfway up the parietal bone as opposed to all the way up. And very important for the rest of our talk, the Neanderthals also have this typical configuration of the occipital, occipital torus with a particular form, cord-like occipital co uh, torus associated with an elongated oval shaped supranial fossa, which is lacking in modern humans. And the list of features that differentiate Neanderthals are throughout the skeleton, there's a suite of features. I'm not going to list them all, there are too many to show. But I, want, I also want to point out to you that these differences are not just uh, something we look at and describe. So we just don't say, well, look, it has a big nose, it's a Neanderthal, for example. We can actually quantify these differences and analyze them statistically and show, in fact, that uh, these two groups of hominins actually look statistically different. So here's a, an analysis. So a lot of different people have done this with measurements, and this is my work from uh, well, some time ago. But these are three-dimensional coordinates, uh, measurements of the face. And what you see here is modern humans and Neanderthals you know, statistically being separated by these differences, what I described to you today, as they are captured by these measurements. And you can see similar results here for the brain case. So a typical Neanderthal shape represented here on the, on the left side of the graph, very clearly different from uh, the globular rounded shape of the skull in modern humans, which are represented here on the right side of the graph. And these differences appear very early in development, some of them even some of these features appear already in Europe. And it's been ascertained that, in fact, modern human children have even an extended, an additional phase of growth. So, modern human and Neanderthal newborns start out having a very similar shape, but very soon after birth, modern human children actually completely depart from the trajectory of growth, what we see in the Neanderthals, adding an extra phase of development, termed here globularization phase by my colleagues, and which results very early on in this rounded, typical rounded shape of the cranium, as opposed to um, this continuous development of Neanderthals, which ends up in the elongated cranial shape. And finally, the last thing I want to say about this is that this rounded cranial shape is something that seems to have evolved not straight away, was not one of the first things that evolved with the appearance of Homo sapiens, but actually appeared gradually as uh, Homo sapiens evolved. So these earliest, early Homo sapiens members are similar to Neanderthals and other archaic humans in an elongated cranial shape. But as you go further, closer to the present in time, you finally get to this round issue. Okay, now the main expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa started between 70 and 50,000 years ago, and we know this both from fossil as well as genetic data. So modern humans actually reached Australia first, probably even before 2,000 years, uh, and East Asia and Europe around 45,000 years ago. And it is very close to this time, so a few millennia later, that Neanderthals and all other archaic hominins disappear, leaving modern humans as the only, so to speak, survivors 
only hominids present today, and really setting the stage for the world as we know it today. But this is, it's a more complicated story than this. So the dispersal of modern humans out of Africa is more complex. It seems we've known for a long time that there were earlier, displaced, uh, um, earlier dispersals of early homo sapiens out of Africa, and we have known this from sites in the Middle East, such as uh, school and Kafze, where we have uh, modern humans present, uh, dated between 130 and 100,000 years before present, and more recently also new evidence showing possibly all the way to 180,000 years ago. So modern humans were already, early modern humans, were already dispersing, doing, moving around, I mean, it's not really surprising, even before this major exodus of 50,000 years ago. What happens in the Near East is after this presence of modern humans between 180 and 100,000 years, Neanderthals actually appear in the region, and modern humans maybe disappear. So one hypothesis is that Neanderthals actually displaced modern humans there until modern humans eventually reappeared in the last exodus and completely displaced Neanderthals. So let's summarize. Early dis the early dispersal of Homo sapiens into the Levant possibly started as early as about 180,000 years. Sometimes in the literature it's termed as a failed dispersal, meaning that modern human populations did not establish themselves forever there, although they did survive for a millennia, but were eventually probably replaced by Neanderthals. And this, these population movements by modern humans and Neanderthals might have been reflecting environmental shifts, right? At the same time, we have paleogenetic evidence, recent paleogenetic evidence, for an interbreeding between Neanderthals and early modern humans before 200,000 years ago. So, again, evidence for early dispersals of modern humans out of Africa. And of course, the Levant in the Middle East is considered a possible contact zone between Neanderthals and modern humans, where these genetic exchanges and possibly also cultural exchanges might have likely taken place. And this finally brings us to the Epidemont Cave Complex. Okay, so let me start by giving you some background on the early research that uh, happened there in the late 1970s and 1980s. So as you see, the site, oh, I had a map here. Oh, I'm sorry, the map didn't make it. I'm sorry, it was in a, got lost in the different versions. So Apikuma is located in the Mani Peninsula in the south of Peloponnese, and as you can see, it's actually on the water. Okay, it's located on the cliff side and on the water, and this makes it quite a challenging place to work. And we'll get this to this in, in a second when we talk about our research there. In the 1970s and 80s, it was investigated by a team from the University of Athens Medical School Museum of Anthropology, led by Professor Pitsius, Leroy Pitsius. And they, this investigation resulted in very important finds from several parts of this cave complex. So perhaps the most famous and, and I don't know, very important finds, most important finds come from Cave A, right? So there are several caves, you can see here five caves, A, B, C, D, and E, and there are finds recovered from all of them, well, maybe not from them, but the most important ones come from cave A, and what was found in cave A was actually two human Pleistocene fossil crania, and these were actually found in the ceiling of cave A. It's a little bit di difficult to imagine, right? When you think about, if you're an archaeologist, you go into a cave and you dig the floor. Uh, that's not what happened here. So let's go back to cave, to the um, <coughs> site, cave A. You must imagine walking up here and looking up at the ceiling, cave A. There it is. This is a photograph from the original investigation from the late 70s. And you see the ladder, and you see the rock. And between the rock, there is a kind of fissure. And it's filled with this breccia 
sediment, which is a conglomeration of bones and rocks and things that are now lithified completely, yes? Very hard sediments. And in this breccia, there were the two skulls. And in fact, they were the team originally located or identified one of these skulls, and while they were trying to remove the block, they found the skull number two. This is what the block of breccia looks like. Again, to remind you, this is a sort of a uh, diagram of the caves, uh, it would have been here, on, in the ceiling of cave A, and here's the photograph again to remind you, cave A is the wall of the So, anyway, so this is a block of breccia, and it's actually quite a small piece of rock. And of course it was actually quite reasonable to think, perhaps, that these specimens, because they were found so close together, probably were of the same chronological age, and possibly represented the same species and maybe even the same population, okay? But at the same time, it was very difficult to date this uh, material at the time. So, it was hypothesized from the beginning that the age of these specimens is likely in the middle of Pleistocene, but of course this is quite vague and it was not really possible to pinpoint that further. And all the original observations were made exclusively on Bigamore 2, which is this one, which is actually the better preserved, uh, or more complete, let's put it this way, one of the two. So these previous observations were limited to um, just very preliminary descriptions and a handful of published measurements, something like nine published measurements, and a few, a handful of published photographs that existed of this specimen. And no detailed uh, comparative analysis or description had been undertaken. But already from this, it was uh, already hypothesized that it's probably representing, it's probably Neanderthal or a pre-Neanderthal, which is what you would expect for a middle crisis in Europe. But as you can also see here, this specimen has actually suffered quite a lot of taphonomic damage and distortion. So any further analysis really had to uh, take into account uh, this damage and try to correct it somehow. Epidema 1 was not clean from the matrix until the early 2000s, so many decades later. It was never described actually at all. And no published photographs or measurements or anything, any information about it existed at all in the literature. It is less complete, so it preserves only the back of the cranium, but it is undistorted, so. But the Epigma Cave Complex also had other findings, not only the important fossils from Cave A. In Cave C, Cave Rama, there were additional very interesting additional human remains, a uh, hypothesized burial, a big one three skeleton, as well as isolated teeth representing possibly more than one additional individual. And you can see here a sort of an artistic reconstruction of what this burial might have looked like and the preservation of the different elements of uh, the skeleton, as well as some uh, x-rays. And these are from the original publications in 1995. Um, of the isolated teeth and the jaw of the skeleton. So uh, potentially a described as a female burial. And this skeleton was found with cultural remains that were also extremely interesting, including pierced shells considered to be beads or ornaments. I think I believe uh, the number that was published was 41 or something like this. And with mythic artifacts that were hypothesized to possibly belong to the upper, upper periphery. Now, of course, this is very interesting. There is no other upper periphery burial that I know of in Greece. And if it is really early upper periphery, it's also a very rare phenomenon in Europe uh, in general. At the time, uh, back in the 80s, there was uh, an effort to date the site that was undertaken by Lenzis and Magnatis using ESR dating of travertines. So two travertine samples were actually produced results uh, between 20 and 45,000. 
But these um, dates, even though they're very interesting somehow, yes, oh my god, it's 45,000, um, they actually are not really associated with any of the findings. So they come from the opening of cave B, the more 10 sample, and the more 30 sample from the opening of cave D. So it's interesting, but even, even in this publication, it's pointed out that it is really difficult to say anything about the finds from these dates. Okay, so the title of this talk is The Significance of the Epidemic Cave Complex, and I think, I hope that by now the significance of this site is becoming clear, because it has produced evidence that it pertains not only to the evolution, sorry, of the Neanderthal lineage with the two middle prices in Crania from Cave A, but also potentially, uh, maybe if the findings from KFC are really from the upper Pacific, uh, potentially important also for understanding the main dispersal out of Africa and how what happened here in Greece, for example, during this last uh, expansion of modern humans. Okay, so now I'd like to talk to you about the analysis that we conducted in the last uh, few years. Uh, with, together with the University of Athens Medical School, uh, but also the American, um, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, the Natural History Museum in London, and Griffith University of Australia. So uh, we were, my team was invited by the University of Athens Medical School to uh, take a look and conduct a comprehensive analysis of the epidemia of human remains. And of course we started with the epidemia A, uh, um, epidemia cave A finds, and what we did is we started with CT scanning, which occurred at us, and then the virtual reconstruction and sort of restoration of the fossils on the computer, which occurred in my lab in Chilligan. We conducted a detailed description and uh, uh, collected uh, different kinds of measurements, 3D measurements as well as normal linear measurements, and we conducted a comparative uh, 3D shape analysis of both specimens as well as new uranium series dates on the specimens. So you have seen already, I think my two is the one that is more complete. Unfortunately, it's lacking the back of the skull and the base of the skull. But you can see the distortion here in this photograph, it's more uh, obvious. And I think my one, it still has a rock stuck to its uh, head, unfortunately. But you can see this is now the back of the skull, right? And it's mostly preserved on the left side. And here you see that there is no extensive breakage or distortion. <coughs> okay, so the first step is the virtual uh, reconstruction and restoration, so to speak. So Apigma 1 is not uh, complete, but it's really not distorted. So it was relatively easy to mirror image the well-preserved site in order to produce a more complete specimen to analyze. Apigma 2 was a different story. So you see here, we start with the scan in yellow, and what happened in between is um, my then PhD student, Carol Rodin, currently postdoc in the team, she segmented, so what does this mean, dissected, virtually dissected, the individual bone fragments, one by one, I believe there were 66 bone fragments. What this allowed us to do is virtually remove the matrix, the sediment, from between the cracks so as to correct distortion and also as a final move the pieces to the correct anatomical position and as a final step, a mirror image the parts that are better preserved on one side to complete them on the other side. Now because there are actually, this is a, a process that even though it's on the computer is done manually it's, it involves a certain amount of error, individual error. So we repeated this process four times by two different observers. So Carol uh, was uh, made two of the reconstructions and another PhD student of mine at the time, Abel Bosman, produced the other two, following two different criteria. So uh, we, have, we ended up with four reconstructions of, of a pigment two. And we used all of them, as well as their mean, as individual specimens in our analysis. So in order to account for any potential error, or um, introduced error, let's say, by our uh, reconstruction. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the results of this analysis. So let's start with Abidimo 2, because it's the one that is the most well known and the one where we already had some hypothesis before. So its overall dimensions and bone thickness indicate that it's an adult. Its linear measurements align it with neanderthals, and it has already, by describing it and looking at it, it's characterized by a whole suite of neanderthal features, which I'm not going to go through, but which are very consistent with what I described to you before for neanderthals when we compare them to modern humans. So no surprises there. It was already thought that this individual represents a Neanderthal or early Neanderthal. If we analyze, we conducted an analysis on two data sets, one focusing on the face and one on the neurocranium. I'm showing you now the facial analysis. Modern humans are represented in blue here. Neanderthals are here in red. These are the early, uh, the ancestors of modern humans from Africa in purple and the ancestors of Neanderthals from Europe in red, in, sorry, in yellow. And when you plot in a bit more two, I don't know why it's not happening, yeah. This is where it falls with Neanderthals, and that's somehow consistent with the observations uh, just from looking at its morphology. And when we look at the second data set, which focuses on the neurocranium, we have a similar picture here with modern humans separated from Neanderthals and this purple uh, polygon here in the middle are the early monitors from Africa and the yellow ones are the Neanderthal ancestors from Eurasia and when we plot in Abidima it falls right between the early the pre-Neanderthals and the Neanderthals. So this is very consistent with what you would expect and with what was uh, described before. We ran a classification analysis and the results now you see multiple results because we use remember four reconstructions plus the mean and two different data sets. So for all of these uh, reconstructions, Apidema 2 is classified as a Neanderthal, with the exception of one where it's classified as uh, an early a pre neanderthal basically. Okay, so, so far so good. And now we're going to Apidema 1. Now this is a specimen that was never described or analyzed before. So again, its overall dimensions, cranial bone thickness are consistent with an adult. But now, in this case, there are no neonatal features. And now remember, maybe you will tell me, well, but it's only just the back of the skull, and you just, you know. But remember, we talked about the neonatal features. The back of the skull is actually really important, really diagnostic. Not only do neonatals have a, a whole suite of features, the occipital bun, the occipital torus, the superior fossa, that are highly characteristic and diagnostic for neonatals, but also modern humans have a very highly diagnostic of the back of the skull. So it is surprising. This individual has no occipital bunny, no lambda flattening, no bone profile, no superior uh, fossil with a torus. Instead, it shows a combination of ancestral and monument features, and especially here around the posterior outline of the back of the skull in lateral view. Let's look at the analysis. Here we also analyzed two data sets. One was overall the neurocranium, the mid sagittal profile, plus landmarks um, laterally, bilaterally. And you see very nice separation again, modern humans in blue, Neanderthals in red. These are the early pre-sapiens, let's put it here somehow, early homo sapiens, or ancestors of homo sapiens from Africa. And these are the pre-Neanderthals in yellow. And if we plot in Apidema 1, this is where it falls. And if we look just at the lateral profile, mid sagittal profile, and the reason we did this is because now we can maximize the sample and include many more fossils that are not so well preserved, that only preserve this part of the skull. And here we have a bit more overlap. You can see that the polygons are actually, the convex skulls are actually overlapping. So modern humans here in blue and Neanderthals are, there's a region of overlap. And here's the pre Neanderthals in yellow, and these are the early homo sapiens, right, or pre homo sapiens from Africa. And if you plot a pigment here, this is very close. Again, within the modern human range and away from the region of overlap. And if it's closest to anything other than modern humans, it's the middle, the middle classes in African humans. Okay, we also ran a classification for Apigma 1, and now there's only one, because we didn't, we had only one reconstruction. And 
uh, these are the classification results. I'd like to point out the numbers here. For the first data set, uh, the, the posterior probability that epidemiologists homo sapiens is 100%, and for the second data set is 93.4%. Uh, so it's actually quite uh, astounding and a very interesting result. So this, just to recap before we move on to the chronology, the first surprise is that Apidema 1 does not look like Apidema 2. It looks like something different. It doesn't look like an animal. It looks like something different. So this idea, this hypothesis, that these two are the same uh, species, maybe even the same population, the same group, maybe buried together. Um, well, maybe it's very exciting for a moment. Well, a group where Neanderthals are together with modern humans it never happened. We don't have this before. And then the chronology results came in. So what we did is we conducted laser ablation, uranium thorium dating, and this was done by Ryan Groom, who's from Griffith University in Australia, and who is the world's leading uh, expert in this uh, method. We applied this on fragments from Apigma 1 and 2, as well as unidentified bone fragments and matrix from the block of uh, segment. And the matrix was dated to about 150,000. The unidentified bone fragments came out in two clusters, one around 160,000 and one over 200,000 years. And these were also sorted by color and kind of sheen. Apidemo 2, consistent with previous dating, was around 170,000. And Apidemo 1, and this is now the second big surprise, was no near Apidemo 1 or Apidemo 2 in age, but was dated to uh, over 210,000 years before this. So, not only are they not the same species, population, but they're also not there at the same time. How do we explain this? And why, how is it possible that something that is found so close to uh, each other that can have such different dates, so many thousands of years? What we think is that this is not the original place of deposition of these specimens. That these were deposited elsewhere in the cave and somehow were moved, redeposited, fell in this fissure, which kind of trapped them which probably was not in the ceiling when they were accumulated from somewhere above, right? And actually this idea is supported by the date of the matrix, which the date of the matrix at 150 signifies the time when the matrix became rock. So this means that you cannot put anything else inside it anymore. So after 150, by default 150 is the minimum age for this cell for these specimens, or anything that is inside this block of matrix. So, one should then remember that breccia is actually often considered to be mixed stuff, and not really stratified or reliable to uh, preserve a kind of nice chronological units, okay? And this, I think, is a missing piece here, but of course, this is the hypothesis. One of the one of the hypotheses we would like to find out more about and test with our uh, field investigations that we are conducting that I'm going to show you. Okay, so um, we also conducted laser ablation, uranium thorium dating on epidemia C, uh, applied on fragments from epidemia three and the isolated T, and. All the dates that were obtained range between 10 and 15,000 years before present. So this was a little bit disappointing, and remember we want them to be at the Paleolithic, so this is terminal Pleistocene, still Paleolithic. We were actually really excited that it's not Paleolithic, and the reason why we are still somehow interested and hopeful, sorry, <laughs> but we were very worried about this, right? We thought this is going to be Paleolithic. But Uranium thorium dating, as those of you that have um, know a little bit about it, you will know that it's a minimum age. Okay, so there's still it's still quite possible that um, that this date in the terminal Pleistocene is actually the minimum age, and that they are in fact 
quite a bit older, maybe even from early apocalyptic, but this is ongoing. It needs to be, there needs to be further dating applied. So, okay, I mean, let me recap the conclusions from this work. Abismo II belongs to the Neanderthal lineage and fits expectations of Neanderthal evolution. Abismo I does not. Instead, it possesses a combination of ancestral and modern human features. It plots with and is always classified as Homo sapiens. It's always closest in its overall shape to modern human individuals and not their shape individuals or Neanderthals. So we concluded from this work that there were two populations living in what is now southern Greece in the middle Pleistocene, an earlier one, which was an early Homo sapiens population around 200,000 years ago, like an earlier, followed by a Neanderthal group, circa 170,000 years before present. And Apigma three, of course, may represent earliest hypothetical Homo sapiens, but of course we need to further date it. And right now we don't actually cannot really say that. What it means for modern human origins in the region and for early dispersals, remember we showed the early dispersals in the Near East and so on. <coughs> what I think is uh, happening here is that, um, well, we, there is no reason why these early dispersals and population movements would have stopped in Israel. And probably we should consider the whole Eastern Mediterranean as a contact zone. The implications are that uh, the, uh, this early dispersal of Homo sapiens out of Africa occurred somewhat earlier, but more importantly, reached much further than previously thought, reached 150,000 years earlier than the earliest apocalyptic Homo sapiens. And this fits very well with the evidence of early Homo sapiens within the land, where we have almost exactly the same scenario, an early Homo sapiens population I think that it's probably the same dispersal event, what we see in Abidema and what we see in Levant, which is then actually uh, replaced by Neanderthals, both in the Levant and also in Mali. So this, in fact, fits, also fits with the genetic evidence suggesting this very ancient interbreeding event before 200,000 years. <coughs> it could have been where this happened, southern Greece and fits the expectation of frequent population movements, high diversity, and contact, what you would expect from a refugium area, from a melting pot in the crisis in the mentioned before. And again, the broader Eastern Mediterranean region might be considered a contact zone, not just the Levant. There is no reason for that. OK, and now I, I know that we are past time, but um, we started late, so we'll <laughs> keep going. So, this is the current project that we are uh, running. And as you see, uh, this is an ERC advanced grant. It's uh, conducted in collaboration with my colleague Stefano Benazzi from the University of Ravenna. And of course, you have still a lot of the same faces, Vangelis, Nick, uh, Caro, uh, uh, Fini, of course, George is still in the team, even, not, even if not in this particular project. Um, and it is the goal of this project is to, uh, it's actually, the idea for this project comes from this work that we did at the end. So if, the question was, if we actually missed, um, if we missed uh, this, what else have we missed, right? So can we look at old collections and can we excavate, re-excavate sites that may preserve additional or similar signals can we reject this hypothesis of early movements of Homo sapiens into the earth? And it is within this project that uh, we have started this field investigation of the Pigma Creek complex, which started last year under the auspices of the Norwegian <coughs> Institute. And um, the goals of this early season last year were actually mainly to establish safe access, safe movement between the caves and to establish a grid and conduct some preliminary assessments of the segments. So what we, what you see here, we're going to see a lot of photographs of the team. I hope that it's visible, I'm not sure. So this is actually uh, me and other members, this is Vagelis right here, and I, I can't see the others, but this is cave eight. Just to give you an idea of the scale, right? So uh, you look at it from afar and it looks okay, you know, but then you're there and it's gigantic, right? 
Um, so as you can see, of course, as you already know, this site is really difficult to access. So it's not possible to climb down this cliff side with, especially not with a bunch of people and students and equipment and so on. So the only way to reach the site is by water. And so this was, it's actually interesting to see that it's not really possible for uh, boats to approach the site in front because there are rock falls inside the water. So it's quite treacherous. And in fact, we were not able to approach for several days when we were there because of rough uh, seas and, and windy conditions. So once we were able to approach, once conditions improved, we uh, established a landing point right around here. You can see the rope. Uh, and then basically traveled by foot on these rocky outcrops to reach the site itself. And I don't know if you can see here on the photograph, but you can see, perhaps you can guess, the presence of ladders and ropes uh, that were secured to, uh, to the rock um, so as to enable us to move between the caves. So here's, oops, sorry, wrong side. This is uh, how we access the site. And it was uh, always a bit stressful getting off the boat and uh, climbing on the wet uh, outcrops, uh, not always uh, without slipping. Um, and of course, uh, here uh, you can see that we had very strict safety protocols with ropes and uh, helmets and uh, nails on the rock and so on. And this is uh, our colleague, Yerya Tatino, and being checked for equipment by Vergelis. These are the PhD students, Rini, Roditi, and Selena Lombardo. And you can see here landing right this. We are here right in front of Cave A. You can see Cave A looming in the background. And this is how steep it is to get up to the to Cave B and Cave C even further up. It's pretty intense. <laughs> Uh, again, checking equipment, preparing for moving. This is us in, in cave uh, B. This is Domenico Giusti, who is our uh, field technician. And uh, Serena and Pini, I believe again. And here accessing cave D, which is the highest one up here. So. We managed to establish uh, a grid, and this was uh, something that uh, took quite a bit longer than we imagined, but, um, and it was very challenging as well to do this. Uh, we, uh, this was done by the Manito Giusti, our field technician, uh, together with the police was in the right? Yes, he was also, <coughs> who was the topographer that is um, collaborating with the Korea Paleontology and Theology Library for many years, and also she was the person collaborating with the original excavators back in, in the 70s and 80s with the uh, refugees team, in fact. So we were able to uh, establish this grid, even though it's not completely finished and it, it will need to be completed now in the next season. That's one of the goals, and you see here uh, the turtle station and the very simple uh, working away. We also assessed the different caves, the in integrity and degree of disturbance of the sediments. And while doing this, we also conducted, oops, what is it, preliminary or uh, limited surface cleaning to try to understand uh, whether these were intact sediments, for example, or back from the previous excavations. So, <coughs> This is Pliny and Cave C. And these sediments, what we removed from this very small cleaning, were actually sieved. And this is uh, Mandelis carrying down the sediments from Cave C. Um, yeah, uh, in order so that they can be sieved, actually. And we already had some finds, even from this very little cleaning. So there were already the big artifacts and fauna remains that were recovered from these sediments, which is actually quite astound astounding to me that even from this very limited, short, um, small area, 
we already have primes, and the most exciting ones are uh, some perforated shells belonging to Tupia Nerea and Cape C, which match the ones that are described by Pitsius from the 80s, and of course are very common in the Paleolithic, also across the region here, and I know also the same species from Frankfurt. So we, we don't know if these are anthropogenic, but it looks very good. Let me see. And additionally, we had other interesting finds with burn and smash cells from KD, which uh, belong to this taxon, which is known to be consumed for food and often is um, processed in a particular way by humans. And we seem to have perhaps the same kind of pattern. So this would be very interesting for further investigation as well. So. Um, 2023 is here, is now, and the next field season is hopefully in a few months. So the main goals are, of course, to continue the topographic documentation of the site with photogrammetry, laser scanning, digital elevation models. Continue the surface cleaning inside KFC and looking uh, further to assess disturbance or backfill. Open trenches, of course, and this will be uh, a very high priority, and collect geological samples from dating. And with this, I would like to thank all the team members, museum curators, collaborators, co authors, uh, the University of Athens, the Greek Minister of Culture and Sports, the American School of Classical Studies, and the Region Institute, of course, uh, the University of Bergen and the University of Tübingen, the funding sources, particularly the European Research Council and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating and somewhat eventful lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we are ready to proceed with uh, the Q&A. So to start the process. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I actually have a few really quick questions. Sure. Um, the first one has to do with how were those caves actually first discovered? I mean, what led researchers to start looking there? Um, how far do you expect the sea to have been at the time when those uh, specimens are dated? And finally, I was really interested um, in the perforated cells that you showed at the end. I was just wondering whether there are signs of uh, use where, perhaps on first glance, and what's really interesting is the genus is Tripia, and um, there, that's the same genus that has been found in the Levant, and especially in Morocco, um, although the, the species is the Gibosula species, but it's really interesting to see the same genus, which is actually the cousin of the South African Nassarius. So the Nassarius, so it, it seems that people at that time were looking for similar, like out of the, all the selection they had, they chose that specific genus. So any thoughts about that? Those are five questions. No, that's <laughs> okay, but they're all very important questions. Maybe I can start with the shells because yeah. uh, I think it's absolutely fascinating that it's this genus, of course. It's very highly exciting and interesting, but this is still under study. We haven't even we haven't even started with that. So I cannot answer to you. I don't know. We don't know. We haven't looked at it yet. But of course it's highly promising and of course we're interested in it and we're looking into that. Again, remember we don't know the date of KC and we don't know how old these um, these shells are. Mm -hmm. So it could be that they're a terminal processing, it could go by the dates we got, it could be that they're much older. We of course plan to conduct dating um, dating analysis and try to pin, pin that down and see if we're really apathetic, no, early apathetic or early But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really titillating somehow, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So let's see. But we have to wait. We cannot jump to any conclusions about that. Now, uh, what was the first question? Uh, uh, how was found? Yes, yeah. okay, so that's easy. It was known to the people. These caves are known to the local people. And if you take a boat from, uh, let's say, Yemeni all the way to the Ross, uh, or even anywhere in Mani, and you look at the coast from the sea, you will see that there are hundreds of caves everywhere. And particularly between Yemeni and the Ross, where you have these drops of rock, like this, cliffsides, 
there are caves yeah. everywhere. And these particular caves were known, and it's actually one of the local um, young people who alerted uh, Theodore Pizios, who was in the region for another purpose at the time, that there was a human skull in one of the caves. So this is how it started, and this is how uh, what prompted the, the research there, right? Mm -hmm. Which is actually not uncommon in the uh, work. Now, the sea level is very interesting and important, and I wasn't going to mention it, but since you did, <laughs> then I will. Uh, <laughs> what we think is going on, this is another question. <coughs> I'm trying to find a good photograph that is uh, not so far away as the last one I showed. Um, sorry, we need to go back quite a bit. There, okay. So, this is a hypothesis, but what we, what we think is going on is that cave A is actually the result of a high level sea step. Okay? So, this cave was opened by what we think. The high level sea stand of the last interglacial 125,000 years ago. And that this is what led to the specimens and the skull block breccia to be exposed. Right? This was already there. It was there before that. It had been deposited before that. Remember the breccia closes become rock at 150,000. So the cave itself, it's actually quite misleading to think of the skulls as being from Cape A, mm -hmm. right, in the archaeological or site formation process sense. Because Cape A, all that it did was cut a hole and expose the segments, the, the, the breccia where these skulls were. Who knows what else was there and got washed away? But okay, we will never know. Right? I mean, okay, this is what we think. And um, if you will notice, these sediments are somehow going through everywhere and in fact um, there is a kind of chimney between Cape A and Cape B. So it's actually it's a hugely complex site and I think that it's uh, it needs a lot of work to really understand how it all came to be <coughs> and it most certainly did not look like this um, through time. It must have been a highly dynamic system uh, that changed quite drastically uh, through time. That's my, that's what I, <laughs> that's what I can say, Thanks. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other question? Uh, so, can I this? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I had, a, I had a few questions. Let's start with the basics. Uh, what kind of a culture in these cases? Would you mean culture as in like food refuse, like the shells of food refuse and uh, that's the, the how the body is placed, the body custom, is that culture? And hence we define the humans and Neanderthals is culture or you mean like culture as in like your Greek I'm, I'm, it's India for example. That kind of culture. What do you mean by culture? One. I have a lot of questions, sorry. It's okay. Like testing. <laughs> I'm expert at any questions. Is that the question? Or is there There's more. more. Oh, there's <laughs> more. Should I answer this one first? Uh, if you want. Yes, I think, let's, well, okay, what is culture? It's a huge discussion, right? In this case, we're talking about material culture, so archaeological remains, right? Mm. So when I talk about cultural remains, I mean things that are a product of human activities mm. um, and are not necessarily human bones. So, for example, when we talk about stone tools, these are cultural remains, yeah? Mm. And, or animal bones that are from things that they ate or maybe even used to make tools or whatever, right? These are cultural remains. That's what that's what we mean. We use context. Okay. okay. So that that is more questions, but I first go with my list of questions and start adding more questions. Uh, this will never end. Uh, so and and mentioned the, the skull in the PDM three, the, the the skull and actual representation of it. Uh, I noticed that. I mean, I noticed it, it's it's full it's full body like. It's, it's it's full frontal face. In yeah, the, the I think you just passed it. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, I was going to ask like, is this like this, this is the artist's representation of it based on like our modern preconceptions of how we do this, how we define let's say body burials, or is this like how if I found in C two like they found the 
Yeah, it's a very good question, and I, I, I really don't know the answer because I wasn't there when I found it. Unfortunately, I wish I would have been there. Uh, it is kind of, it's a liberal artistic representation. The head, for example, doesn't exist. So there was no head, that, no scholar, but just a man, piece of a mandible. So, of course, you can see not all of the, it's not, it's not a complete skeleton, yet it's shown quite complete with a kind of pillow head, whatever stone. Um, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, I'm not really sure how it was found. Uh, but I do want to say that there are burials that look like this from the Paralympic um, that even are older than this. So from Neanderthals and uh, early morning humans, for example. And it's not something that would be I mean, this would have been something that you would expect if it's a burial. Now, whether this was found like this or not, it's hard to say, I think, at this point. And uh, that, I mean, just to add to the point of culture, the last question as well as this question. Uh, so you mentioned stone tools and other materials. So when we found lithic artifacts and foreign artifacts here, did they go to a particular category, like the Achillean category and the other? I'm sorry, say that again? Like the, the stone tools, they go yeah. particular categories of stone tools, like they belong to, let's say, the, the Achillean category, I don't know many. No, they don't belong to the Achillean. This would be early Paralympic. Hmm? They belong, the KFC artifacts, these ones, yes. uh, have been described as early epithet, potentially early epithet. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a final, let's say, a practical question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, wait. As you said, he had to build like a small landing ramp to get to the caves. Like, at, like, at, uh, when the when the weather when the, when the water was better and, and the seas were better, you had to build a small landing and then you could get bigger no, groups. We, we didn't build any landing. No, we as you mean we built a platform. Platform. No, yeah. no, we didn't do that. No. Okay, so this would mean that back in in two thousand thousand years ago, those people like humans who lived the Neanderthals who lived later also did not build any landing ramps, they just ran their boats to the caves and got in? Well, it's actually it's a very good question. How did they get in? How did anyone get there? Right? And for this um, question, we have to think about, again, what we were talking before. When you asked, when you were asking, what was the sea level and how was this formed? How was the site formed? We really don't know what the site would look like. It mm. certainly did not look like this. So we don't really know how it would have been if there was another way to access the site or whatever. But it's also interesting, and I don't have the slide here, that, and this is also a hypothesis that is somehow really fascinating, and maybe it will work out, but maybe it will be rejected by further research, that the dates we got for the unidentified small fragments and for the skulls actually seem to fall in time periods with lower global sea levels, which suggests that maybe this is actually would explain how you have such disparate ages, that maybe the site was more accessed, possible to access um, only when the sea levels were low, and not like today. Today, of course, we are in a period of warm phase and high sea levels. Uh, so we are seeing the, in the glacial, snapshot of what this site would look like. So in addition to not knowing what the configuration of the site would have been like in the past, we also don't we also have to imagine it during times of lower sea level because sea levels go up and down but that remains static through time through geological time. Yeah? That's good. Okay yes. If just a related question, if you have any clues from the bathymetry, for example, if the sea level is 10 meters lower, you know, can you walk there from somewhere? I don't have any clues about okay. this, sorry, <laughs> we haven't gotten that far, but it's something that would be very interesting to look at, and I know that people have been looking in the uh, Manu region in general about sea levels and uh, the different, so this is something definitely for the future. Uh, right now we have our hands full with dealing with the sea
that now is uh, Aegean Sea was covered by water or was a... Uh, okay, this is a good, again, sea levels go up and down and it's been hypothesized that large sections or parts of the Aegean would have been maybe swampy regions or land, but not everywhere, clearly. So... I there is a, a territorial breach yes. for the migration. Well, there is anyway, even if the sea level is at present, is more or less, well, okay, it's not completely, but yes. There would be, for example, some islands would be connected with Anatolia, for example, or other islands with mainland Greece, and there would be, presumably, easier crossings, yes. But it's not possible that uh, those primitive uh, humanoids were able to, to construct the boats? Well, this is a very big discussion. We have already Homo erectus in Indonesia in, in islands, and it's been hypothesized that maybe they got there by boats. And we have also big discussion about Crete. Was Crete already? Uh, did we have Paleolithic people in Crete? Uh, Neanderthals already there? I mean, this I know is a very heated uh, discussion. But this is something that we are not entirely. Uh, entirely sure about. It. But yes, the idea is that there would have been a land crossing, yes. All right then. Yes? Thank We're you good. very much for this fascinating. Thank you.